Welcome. My name is Anna Krishnarsa. I'm the director of the Europe Center. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome back uh, Yoni Kampfors, who is a visiting uh, scholar here at the Europe Center at years back. He's currently a postdoctoral scholar in political science at the European University Institute in Florence and a senior research fellow at the Polarization and Social Change Lab at Stanford University, uh, just downstairs. His research focuses on the roots of political divides in advanced democracies, and his methodological expertise is randomized field and survey experiments. Um, his research has been featured in several prominent outlets, and today he'll speak on separation by degrees, how the lack of contact between higher and lower educated classes um, causes political divides. So Yanni will speak, then we'll open it up to Q&A, um, and we will end at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Yanni. Thank you. Uh, it's it's great to be back. Uh, my office was back there, and actually, I think substantial parts of this paper were were written uh, in that office because this is a project that's been going on for uh, for quite some time. Uh, although I don't think I'd, I'd still recognize it uh, uh, if I look at what I did two years ago. Um, so this project, separation by degree, how the lack of contact between the higher and lower educated explains political divides. This is joint work with uh, Jona de Jong, who is also at the European University Institute. So what I will talk about today, um, just like many other papers out there, sort of what we focus on is the continued rise of the radical right and of the new left, which is commonly seen as uh, mainly green parties in Europe, and very much accompanying that, accompanying that the polarization on sort of cultural issues like immigration, uh, the EU, uh, gender attitudes. And what is key here is that education, so whether you're higher or lower educated, tertiary a degree or not, university educated or not, that seems to be the key predictor in explaining sort of these, uh, these, these patterns in, in voting behavior and in attitudes in Europe. And we sort of try to figure out why that is. So the argument that we put forward is that it's the decreased interaction and relationship formation between those with and without higher education uh, that reinforces uh, education-based political divides. So according to the argument that I'll show you in the rest of the talk, it's the fact that there is less contact between the higher and lower educated that sort of makes progressive people more progressive and conservative people more conservative, and that helps explain political divides. Uh, and as evidence, uh, I, uh, we use uh, panel data and cross-sectional data of social networks, and then we have a set of outcomes that sort of capture these, uh, these uh, political outcomes. So, of course, uh, if we talk about the radical right in Europe, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, it's my home country, and that's actually where we saw the last big radical rights victory happening in Europe. The builders against expectations won the elections uh, and is a very typical example of a politician that sort of reflects the role of education here, uh, because just like in many other European countries uh, and actually with Trump as well in the US, uh, he was disproportionately attracting lower educated uh, voters. However, this is not just a Dutch story here, just to quickly illustrate, this is data from all elections in Western Europe since from 1975 until 2021. And you sort of see that radical right parties and green parties are clearly increasingly getter, getting a higher percentage of the votes in countries, whereas the standard mainstream parties like the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats increasingly get fewer votes. So none of this is really kind of new. Um, well, what's then the dominant explanation out there to explain these patterns, and that's sort of what we're going to build on, is what's often called uh, cleavage theory. And according to cleavage theory, uh, to understand sort of these patterns and the rise of these parties and this attitudinal polarization, uh, generally you should look at what's often called a critical juncture, which is then a, a big change in society. At least the standard example that is often given in this work is something like the Industrial Revolution, so think of really big changes. And this then leads to long running societal conflict. In this example of the Industrial Revolution, that would simply be uh, workers versus uh, owners of, uh, of businesses and of factories. And then what is supposed to happen is that uh, party competition and voting and what parties do and where they position themselves sort of structures around this conflict in, uh, in society. So when it comes to voting for the radical right uh, and for uh, green parties nowadays, uh, as the argument goes, it was globalization, automation, the knowledge revolution that sort of since the 1980s was the, the big change in society that laid the roots for this new type of uh, social, social conflict, meaning that there are new groups of winners and losers. 
in society. And these winners and losers are the people that either vote uh, for uh, the new left parties or for, uh, for radical right parties. This is often also called there being a second dimension of political competition. Sounds kind of technical, but this effectively means that attitudes that are about this new conflict do not map onto a traditional economic left-right state intervention in the market versus no state intervention in the market, right? So you, you can be against state intervention in the market and be very pro-migrants, or you can be against state intervention in the market and uh, be very anti-migrants. So it's like a, it doesn't map onto existing, existing conflict. Um, so who are then these winners and losers when it comes to globalization? Well, uh, Hoge and Marx put it as one side embraces open societies, cultural diversity, and international governance, whilst the other side considers these as a threat to their national community and their way of life. Key here is that for this new cleavage, there are social roots, being that there are certain social groups in society that uh, uh, have these attitudes. And what has been shown to matter is gender, class, place of residence, identity, social identities, but once again, ma mo mainly it's education. So it seems to be something about um, more higher educated people probably see themselves as the winners of these processes and lower educated people see themselves as the losers of these processes. And that then drives their uh, voting behavior. So to sort of show you that education is indeed very important here, what I show here is uh, how well education being higher educated predicts voting for progressive parties or for radical right parties, which is indicated by the colors and the shapes as compared to other demographic characteristics. So uh, we're looking at being an ethnic minority, gender, uh, how, where do you come from a city or not, age, even in decades or income. And we see compared to all these other factors, it's clearly being higher educated that is doing uh, a lot of the work here. So education really is key in understanding the rise of the radical right, the rise of greens, and this attitudinal polarization you see in Europe on uh, issues like immigration. But of course, this is not just a European story, it's also an American story. Uh, we increasingly in the US see that there are similar educational divides as well. This started uh, around uh, the Obama election, uh, where we increasingly see that lower educated people that used to vote for the Democrats are now voting for the Republicans. Uh, so this diploma divide, as it's been called, is uh, not just a fault line in Europe, but it's increasingly starting to be a fault line in uh, American politics too. So what explains why education matters? And this is sort of where we start to uh, come in with our contribution. So there are kind of two families of theories here. One is called the liberalization hypothesis, which effectively states that there is a causal effect of attender, attending higher education. And this can be uh, through the wage premium, you attend higher education, you're richer, and therefore you have these attitudes. But it can also be uh, because of something unique about the experience of education. When you're in higher education, you uh, learn new things and you become more open-minded and it's these things that then change your attitudes and your voting behavior. The alternative hypothesis effectively states that there is no direct relationship between higher education and these outcomes. It's uh, completely endogenous to having progressive parents. And the story here is that if you have progressive parents, you're socialized by your parents and the socialization hypothesis, and you're socialized by your parents to have these attitudes, but you're also socialized by your parents to seek out going to university. Um, so those are the two sort of competing theories out there. What our contribution is going to be is that uh, once you are in higher education, that also leads you to have more higher educated networks. Once you're in higher educated networks, uh, homogenous higher, higher educated networks, you only know other higher educated people that reinforce, reinforces your existing progressive attitudes. So we sort of say there's some process going on, whether it's liberal, liberalization or the socialization hypothesis, there's some process going on that makes the higher educated a little bit more progressive. But then because being higher educated influences what your network looks like, those existing progressive attitudes are sort of rein, reinforced. Um, so it's uh, the network composition of the higher educated people, and in particular that these networks are more homogenous, uh, that leads to political divides. <clears throat> so to sort of support this argument, I want to show you three sets of results. So the first one is uh, clearly we need to show that networks are indeed more homogenous based on education. That means that higher educated people increasingly uh, know mainly other higher educated people and no lower educated people. 
Then I quickly want to show you that there is indeed an association between these specific network compositions and these outcomes that we're interested in. Uh, and to sort of at least a little bit because causation remains extremely difficult because of course, like many other things, networks maybe especially are not random. Uh, your, your friends are not randomly assigned. You choose them for some reasons. So uh, to sort of at least try to get into the direction of causation, uh, we focus on a change in uh, someone's network. So this first set of results, do the higher and lower cadet indeed not interact? Are they in homogeneous networks? So the data that we use is uh, from someone's own self-reported uh, network. And once again, the key question is, do people know others with a different education level? And then it's very important, is such a network composition likely based on uh, random chance? Is there some sort of selection process going on for whatever reason, or is it just likely by random chance that you, only have, that you are in homogeneous networks? Uh, what we use what's called a case control method. It sounds complex. Uh, it was pretty complex to figure out what it is, uh, but effectively what it comes down to is uh, simply you randomize someone's network. So as opposed to the friends that people have, you assign friends at random. And what does the real network look like as compared to the, the, the network by a coin toss? Um, so it's the Dutch list panel. So most of the data that I'm gonna show you today pertains mainly to the Netherlands. We focus on the last wave, it's 1700 people. And to measure networks, we use a question that's called a name generator question. People are asked, uh, if you look back on the last six months, with whom did you discuss important things? Please enter their first names below up to five people. So they mention five people, and then they're asked questions about each one of these five people. So you know, one person I discussed important things with is, is Joe or Anna, and then uh, people are being asked, well, what's Joe's education level? What's his race? Uh, what's Anna's education level? What's Anna's race? So it's five ties, at least up to five ties, because they can enter up to five names. Well, these are then already the results. So we show in the dots with the confidence intervals what the real data is. And these are sort of these simulated baselines. So what would networks look like if your friends are determined by Quintos? What we show on the y-axis is the proportion of ties with other people. So other people being friends, people being reported in this name generator question. So the proportion of ties um, that are with someone who has a different, uh, has the same education level. So of these ties that people report, what proportion uh, is to someone that has the same education level? So we see that for higher educated, about 65% of the ties people re report are with other higher educated people. And for lower educated, this is about the same. What's interesting, however, is that compared to this uh, randomized baseline, higher educated are more likely to be in homogeneous networks uh, than lower educated people. So sort of the first bit of evidence, yes, it's true. People are very much in networks that are homogeneous along educational lines. Uh, in fact, and this is not shown here, but we find in the paper, that education level is more important than uh, gender, and it's about as important as ethnicity. So you're more likely to know someone with uh, the same education level than you are to know someone with the same gender, and you're about as likely to have friends with the same education level as you are to have friends with uh, the same ethnicity. So education really matters. So having established that, we move to the second piece of evidence, which focuses on uh, the question if there is an association between uh, the composition of someone's network and these uh, outcomes, pro progressive uh, uh, attitudes and voting. So what we do here, the independent variable is how many ties someone has to someone with a different education level, similar to before. And then once again, we focus on immigration, the EU, gender attitudes, and uh, voting for these parties. Um, we include a whole bunch of control variables. Uh, I mean, it remains, of course, uh, completely observational, uh, but it's quite an extensive set of controls. So at least we're certain that what we show is not driven by something else that the literature has, uh, has really focused on. So these are then uh, the results. So the x-axis shows the predicted outcome, and the y-axis shows the network composition of people. Uh, I show it on this slide for four outcomes, immigration, voting radical rights, voting progressive, and uh, attitudes towards the EU. High and low here refers to the education level of people, and the number of ties refers to uh, the number of ties someone has with someone who has a different education level. So we see that higher educated people who know no one 
that is lower educated are about 27% likely to vote for the Greens, whereas lower educated people who know no one with uh, a higher education level are only about 10% likely to vote for the Greens. So sort of two things stand out clearly in all these outcomes. Uh, first of all, this network composition, the number of ties to people with a different education level, how many of the people that, that, that have given respondent enters in this name generator question um, are of a different education level. That very strongly predicts uh, attitudes on these, on these outcomes. At the same time, and this is, I think, maybe one of the more interesting results here is that actually the differences within the education groups are larger than differences between the education groups, which are illustrated by the dashed line. So in a way, there's more variation within the higher educated and the lower educated in their propensity to vote uh, for uh, the radical rights than there is between the higher and the lower educated. And we can sort of get at this very well if we focus on this network uh, composition. Here I show you uh, the results for two more outcomes. The rest of the graph is the same. So for attitudes on how progressive you are on gender, we find the same. And then this is sort of our placebo outcome. This focuses on redistribution. And we show this to sort of illustrate that this really is something about education level and how it induces uh, liberal values. And it's not something about economics or economic class, right? If, if how homogeneous your network is based on education level is very reflective of your economic class or your income, then we would expect an effect on outcomes that relate very much to economic class and economic income, right? And we don't find that at all. Uh, so this is sort of a bit of a piece of confidence that it's this is not really a story about uh, uh, about class or income. Uh, of course, so far we focused on up to five ties only, which means that you likely enter the five people that are very dear to you, and that's actually what we see. A lot of people enter their parents, their children, their the partner is the most common tie people enter, obviously. Um, but of course, we know from the sociological literature that there are strong, important differences between strong ties and weak ties. So to sort of see whether weak ties matter too, we focus on uh, a different subset of this data set where they were asked what the education level is of up to 25 people. So the same name generator question, but instead with five people, they were asked about 25 people, meaning that we talk that then we're talking about colleagues, uh, you know, who's the 24th most important person you've talked to, that's probably a colleague you talk to once a month, uh, and who is maybe not a very, a very strong, uh, it's not a very strong connection. Let us show you here, and this is quite quick, on the x-axis we now have the average education level of someone's network, the average education level of these 25 ties, higher means more educated. Uh, here on the y-axis we have these outcomes again, on immigration, higher values means being, being more progressive. For radical right voting, obviously lower values mean uh, liking the radical right less. So with uh, 25 ties as opposed to five, point being the, the conclusion sort of stands. This is not just a story about strong ties, it also applies to weak ties. Up to now, the only data I've shown you is data from uh, the Netherlands. So another key question is, I mean, we of course know the electoral system in the Netherlands is quite different. Uh, it's the most proportional system in the world. Uh, so maybe this is something that only emerges in a very particular context. Uh, what about the rest of Europe? So to do that, we turn to the European Social Survey, where unfortunately we do not have this name generator question, but we do have a question about the education level of someone's partner. So as opposed to on uh, five ties or 25 ties, we're just gonna focus on uh, partners here. Mm -hmm. And what we see here, once again, these plots are very similar as before. X-axis, the predicted position, so sort of where you fall uh, on, on these outcomes. And on the Y-axis, we have uh, someone, uh, the network composition, so uh, someone being higher educated, for instance, with a higher educated partner, or someone being lower educated with a lower educated partner, or higher educated with no partner. And effectively, we see very similar pattern as before. Right? Um, uh, if you, the probability to vote radical rights, if you're lower educated, the lower educated partner is maybe like 7%, whereas if you're higher educated with a higher educated partner is less than less than 2%. Uh, the effect size has clearly changed a bit because we moved from the Netherlands to Europe, but yeah. I just a clarifying question. The high low partner and a low high partner are immigration. So your partner basically predicts your views. Yes, the it's, that's exactly it, yeah. 
So yeah, so the it's the it's the education level of someone's partner that's really doing uh, doing the work here. Just like in these last results, it's the uh, education level of the of, of the ties that you have. Um, so once again, here in the rest of Europe, these same patterns uh, sort of seem to hold as what I showed you before. So to then move a little bit closer to a more uh, causal story, because up to now, as I've said before, it's mainly observational data. Causality is clearly the elephant in the room. Networks are not random and people self-select into them. So even though we control for many things uh, like income, like class, which we also do with these placebo tests, and um, uh, you know we're, we're not really there yet. Uh, so what we then do is we move to using the panel components of the list data set. Uh, we, up to now, we uh, mainly showed you results from the last couple of waves, but we use now the, the rest of the panel data sets so we can trace the same individuals over time. The treatment in this context becomes having a higher educated tie. So we focus on what happens if a person in this data set from one uh, uh, moment in time to the next moment in time suddenly gets a higher educated tie. So someone gets uh, a connection to someone else who is higher educated. This can happen uh, either because an existing tie becomes higher educated. So a friend I already had before uh, graduates and becomes higher educated or someone registers a new tie probably because they meet a new person that becomes an important person for them. Uh, we look at very similar outcomes as before, these attitudes on these issues, but also voting for these parties. Uh, and we use a standard uh, generalized diff and diff. So it's a two-way fixed effects model. When we started this paper, uh, the issues with two-way fixed effects models were not very much out there yet, uh, but uh, it's robust to negative weighting, which I will uh, show you uh, later on as well. And then, of course, we add some controls that vary over time, uh, which uh, mainly income, age, the number of ties people report, and very important, whether people attend higher education, right? Because you can imagine that you get higher educated ties when you attend higher education. So we want to make sure that we're not just capturing the effect of attending higher education. So that's why we, why we control for that. So to sort of give you a little bit of an insight of, uh, into when people then get these high ties in their lives, on the x-axis, we show age. So for all people in our uh, survey that are age 20, uh, what percentage of them experienced an increase in the number of uh, higher and lower educated ties? And we break this out by whether people are uh, or will be attending university and whether they're not attending university. Uh, so for instance, about 15% uh, of 40-year-olds in our data that do not go to university uh, experience a, uh, a change in their, in their ties. So the point being, tie changes happen throughout the ages. It's not just when you're young that your social network changes. Um, and they happen often. So people switch in and out of treatment quite often. It's not just a couple of people that drive our, uh, uh, our treatment effects. Uh, and also important, those that do not go to university, clearly it happens less often to them that they uh, meet someone who is higher educated but they still get, get treated. To then directly move to the results. So on the x-axis, we have the years before getting this treatment. Once again, the years before you experience uh, meeting someone who is higher educated. On the y-axis, we now have the change in the, in the outcome. Um, so we see in most sort of most results line up with expectations being that once you get this treatment, you become a little bit more progressive. You clearly see it for EU attitudes. Once you uh, meet someone who is higher educated, you become um, uh, more likely to vote for progressive parties, although it's only significant at the 10%. You meet someone who is higher educated, you become more pro-immigration. Um, we very clearly see it as well with gender attitudes. And for radical right voting, there is a clear pre-trend. Uh, so that's potentially an issue, but in general, the results sort of align. And also important, once you meet someone who's higher educated, it changes nothing on your attitudes about economic issues. So once again, sort of as a bit of evidence that this is not a story that is about, about, uh, about social class. Of course, we should be cautious with causality here uh, because it's a difference in differences with individual level panel data, never works very well. Uh, and the effect sizes are quite small, but hopefully it's a little bit of uh, helps us have a little bit more confidence that this really is something about changes in network composition and not self-selection into networks. 
Uh, of course, we're at Stanford, so I can't proceed here without actually showing that this is robust in negative way. Uh, don't have to look at it long. Uh, in fact, the results are a little bit stronger if we correct for this. So what are then the final conclusions? Well, first of all, it's clear that higher educated citizens surround themselves with higher educated citizens and that the likelihood to do this is more so than the likelihood to surround yourself with people of the same gender and about the same as the likelihood uh, to surround yourself with people of the same ethnicity. Then once you're in these network education, uh, in these specific networks based on education level, that seems to influence your attitudes and your voting behavior. Um, but of course, causality remains a little bit difficult. So in other words, the distinct worldview that the higher educators have for, uh, is reinforced in homogeneous networks. You are more progressive, you end up in a higher educated network, all your friends are higher educated, and that makes you more, more progressive, uh, which sort of explains contemporary political divides. That's the zest of our, our story. Uh, and what are then further takeaways from this? Well, first of all, it seems that globalization really is creating a new dividing line in society. One key debate when it comes to dividing lines in societies or cleavages, as they're often called in political sociology, is that there are organizations where people indeed only meet others that are similar to them. And these organizations used to be uh, before and especially right after the Second World War, things like unions and churches where you meet people that have the same religion as you, that are also workers and sort of these organizations used to reinforce existing political divides. And a critique that's often mentioned about globalization not being a new dividing line is that these organizations are not there anymore. Uh, and sort of one thing that we want to argue here is that social networks, uh, because of social sorting, have sort of taken, taken up the role that uh, a place like unions and churches would, uh, would, would play in the past. So globalization really is uh, a new cleavage also very important, fostering contact between the higher and lower educated may be a tool to reduce uh, political divides. If our thesis is true, and a lot of division on these progressive issues is caused by the fact that people don't know others with a higher education or with a different education level, then providing places where the higher and lower educated can meet can sort of mitigate these, uh, these political divides. Um, and that's it, thank you. <laughs> So we'll open up the Q&A. Where's Christophe? Yeah, I have a question about the very last point. Uh, I know we've talked about this before, so maybe I've heard this question before. Um, so, but um, um, the, I mean, the question, maybe the most important question for uh, policy uh, makers is how to uh, how to change that to the extent that you think that polarization is a bad thing, and how can you foster that that contact? And uh, you mentioned churches, of course, that, that was a, a different kind of cleavage. Oh, they should be into military service. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to uh, foster this uh, contact? Yeah, oh, of course it still works. I forgot about that. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a good point. I, you're right that often what is mentioned is military service. Uh, this is one of the key ways to do this. Uh, I'm not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. Uh, but uh, I mean, other ways this, this can work. And this is especially relevant in Europe where it's um, in contrast to the US common to track people in different tracks in high school at an earlier stage on, whereas in the US, you know, you're for a very long part in the same high school. Some people go to university, others go to community college and others, uh, I mean, especially used to be, uh, didn't do any college at all. You just graduate high school in the US and you start working and you were in the same class with these, uh, with these people in your, in your little home, home, hometown. Uh, and in Europe, that sort of mechanism isn't really there because of tracking in, in high school. Uh, so in, in Germany, for instance, I think it's already from age 11 or 12, you separate the kids out uh, based on different tracks. And one track is pretty much the only way to go to university and other tracks are, uh, it's really hard to get to university uh, if it's possible at all. 
and sort of ensuring potentially that there is uh, more contacts between kids in a way uh, similar, more similar to the US or that this tracking, tracking happens at a later age. That could be one way to sort of uh, still foster, foster contact. And that's at least the way I think could be um, the most promising. Yeah. So, so this is very interesting, and I just want to first double check if I understood this correctly, that when you have people with a different level of education, uh, views change, including for people who are more highly educated, they become less progressive, as well as more progressive among the lower education. So, you know, so I'm just, I guess I'm a little bit, I'm curious of like, what do you think the mechanism is, right? Because in a way, um, <clears throat> could be some kind of social influence, right? But it's puzzling to me that uh, say someone who was progressive becomes kind of less progressive. Is that because they understand the concerns of other types of people or are they realizing that their views are too out there and they kind of uh, you know, adjust to their community? So like what exactly is the mechanism? And relatedly to that, you know, so um, you say you don't find an effect on economic uh, attitude and presume is that because basically income, you're controlling for income and you know, holding that constant but in a way if it's about social influence i think that uh, people's views of economic policy should also change when they're influenced by other people's views you know uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said that people often hold views contrary to their own economic interests uh, for whatever reason especially people with lower education levels and that's because they're not necessarily understanding their self-interest, et cetera, and they're somehow holding these beliefs separate from their concrete economic standing. So I'm curious why if you don't find this. Um, very good questions, especially the, the first one. Uh, 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 and I, I, I know it's a good question because I'm going to give a very bad answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 it's just hard to get at that with this type of data, uh, at least the way uh, we coded up this treatment and it's hard to do it any different way because the effects are relatively small and it, you know this data is very noisy because everything is self-reported. So we can't really distinguish whether this effect is caused by people gaining a tie or people losing a tie. Both these things go into uh, the estimation of this effect. And then, so that's already hard. And then to sort of also separate that into uh, higher and lower educated people, that's, it's just not really possible with this data. So it could very well be that it's indeed the case that a higher educated person that loses a higher educated tie and therefore gains a lower educated tie, that that is not really doing much. Uh, this is of course, when it comes to the second part where we present the causal story, uh, which is probably the you know, most robust uh, uh, set of results to answer your question. So there we don't really know. And in, and in this first part, uh, yeah, we, there we clearly see these differences within the higher educated nonetheless, but there we can't really with confidence say if it is self-selection into networks or the effect of these networks. So it's just, it's just really tricky to get at it because it's, it's something that's hard to measure and that is, it's very noisy. Um, so then, you know, the, the best thing to do is probably talk to, talk to people. Uh, we don't like doing that as political scientists. <laughs> uh, and to your uh, to your second question, um, what about economic attitudes? Well, here I I think I, I'll be a bit more resolute, and I would say that what we uh, show, and therefore what we uh, you know yeah what what I think is actually true, is that the key dividing line between the higher and lower educated really is something about being more progressive or not, and it's not necessarily something that is about economics, uh, right? And which in a way, it's sort of also something that you see happening in the last couple of years where the college wage premium is actually decreasing, right? It's if you if you want to if you want to make money, uh, you shouldn't be a political scientist, you should be an electrician. Uh, uh, and that's so, uh, yeah, I really think college, uh, college or not is something that's about progressive attitudes and it's not as much about economics. Sharon, did you have a question? Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I was thinking like you exactly, thinking that education is a major factor. Until 10 years ago, at Humanity Center, it was a journalist that I don't remember her name, but was assigned by a Democratic Party to go to the central part of the U.S. and study why people uh, vote Trump. And uh, she presented her book. And really, it was a big shock for me and for everyone that was there. And she asked people to stop calling Trump land. 
And she lived over there with people for one year. And she explained why people voted for Trump. And I realized that it's not only a matter of the education, but it's much deeper than that. And um, I myself was immigrant in Europe, and I have friends that um, they have PhD, all of them. And I see that how they have changed during the last 40 years that I know them. And if I could uh, like put name right now on them, I would say that they are very conservative. The same people that were very uh, progressive 35, 40 years ago when I knew, and still they are friends with me that I am immigrant, but they are against immigration because there are other factors. Um, so I have two, two answers to that. First, I, I completely agree with you. It's not just education, of course, that's, that explains voting for people like Trump and for political right candidates. Uh, it's sort of what we are trying to say is that uh, once people, it's often education uh, that have different worldviews because of some reason, uh, if they are then in homogenous networks, these, these worldviews are reinforced. So it's sort of, there are clearly other things going on and I don't think we sort of exclude that from being true, um, but uh, I do think we are arguing that education is probably one of the most important drivers behind, uh, behind uh, Trump voting. Uh, and I'm also not saying that our explanation is the only reason why education matters. It's sort of, uh, it's, it's maybe why uh, education has become more important or uh, it's, it's just a, a explanation for why education matters so much, but it doesn't exclude other explanations to be true. Um, and I, 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 I completely agree with you. There are many other explanations out there. When it comes to uh, people that are, uh, once they age, become uh, more conservative, that's in general, that's a trend that we see is true. But one interesting thing there is that if you actually look at younger generations, you see that that trend does not hold up anymore. So people that are my age right now, I'm, I'm, it, was, it was actually my birthday uh, uh, two days ago. Uh, so <laughs> people, <thank you. laughs> people that were uh, my age right now are not as conservative as they should be. Uh, as compared to people who were uh, 31, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, our, our argument fits very well with that because this uh, educational homogeny thing, only knowing other people that are higher educated is increasingly something we see with uh, younger generations. Uh, so it could be that young, uh, well, not that young anymore, but uh, people that are 30 right now are not as conservative as they should be compared to previous generations because people that are 30 right now uh, are increasingly in homogenous networks. Well, as people that you know, were 30, 30 years ago probably had more heterogeneous networks. Uh, so I think, I think uh, yeah, long story short, I feel our story fits very well with, uh, with the points you made. Thanks for a great talk. I'm wondering how many of the ties that you observe are uh, parent-child ties? particular in your two apex fed model, like when people are gaining additional uh, high education ties, is that often because their children are gaining university education or moving up in the education ladder? Um, and I wonder like, if you think that these mechanisms would work differently for intergenerational ties versus ties between you and someone who's the same age as you. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, uh, the, the results hold up as well if you only focus on younger people. I didn't show that here, but uh, you know, if you focus for people up to 30 years, it's sort of the same result is there. Um, and it's, of course, impossible to be younger than 30 and have a child that goes to university. Um, uh, so that's, that's not it. Um, whether there are differences based on the type of tie, uh, it's something we try to look at quite hard, um, but it's just not really something you can get at very well in the sense of how close you are with this person. Um, we do find that partners are more important than uh, than other ties, which sort of makes sense. So there is something to this story of it's true that the person that is closest to you has the strongest influence on you. Um, but but to sort of like better unpack that, that has turned out to be just really difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to hear more about a point that we maybe didn't have time for, which is the um, related ties that you talked about. I just don't know what the, how you would go about doing something like that. So I'm curious to hear more about that. And then another question I had 
speaks to um, the plot where you can go out the y axis and you can have a number of high tides and you have low tides, and you have on the x a propensity to both, I think. And um, in the subsequent plots, you have like a high, high partner. Well, you know, you describe the visual characteristics as well. And I, I don't know if the the plot, the first plot we're describing right now, the number of times, whether that also has sort of the interaction of your own computation built into that. Because I, I don't know if that plot is sort of showing the effect of number of times or if it's the additive effect, like you're saying, of education reinforcing the power of the plot. Um, good question. So, I mean, how to simulate these styles? It's, um, you know, you have a data set with uh the ties that people report um and then you create a sort of like a second data set where you randomly match people with each other um so of the same sort of the same people in the data uh, a given respondent another respondent you randomly match them with each other uh you therefore have the social demographic characteristics of both people um you do that a million times so you have a million randomly matched two respondents uh, and you sort of code you code these randomly matched people as not being ties because they're they're randomly matched people they're not actual ties and then you compare that to the data set where people were ties because you said a reported ties uh, and then it's just a simple regression of uh, um, you know the outcome is a real tie uh, and therefore you see whether a real tie uh, is uh, more or less likely uh, based on demographic characteristics as compared to what would happen if friends were random uh, it's a it's a bit like it's a bit yeah I I found it because I'm I'm uh, probably more a political scientist and I'd like to admit and I found it uh, a difficult method to wrap my head around sort of dipping my toes into the sociology um, but I think that's the best I can explain it. Uh, but, um, so you're drawing from the school of respondents and their reported uh, No, you only draw from a pool of respondents. Oh, so there are respondents and the reported ties and. You sort of make the assumption that these reported ties also come from the population of the Netherlands. Then you make the assumption that the sample is representative of the population of the Netherlands. And then drawing from that sample, you create fake ties. So you're you're sort of saying that you create a sample of potential, but not real ties that there could be, uh, like real ties that could have been reported in this data set. But that weren't reported. So that's sort of um, so it's like the whole story foster stands with uh, um, the sampling process actually being good, um, which, you know, <laughs> also something we don't talk about. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, I hope it makes sense. Um, and then as to your uh, second question, uh, you know, where does the level of education come in there? So we sort of did two things there. Um, first of all, it's fully factorized. So for, uh, right, you can be higher or lower educated uh, with uh, zero, one, two, or more than three or more ties per person. So it's like eight different, um, you know, buckets. So it's like fully factorized into the model. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we also separately control for education in a linear fashion, because a critique that we often get, we, we have a binary version of education, but maybe what is going on is that uh, within the lower educated, uh, you know, it's people that only have high school or people that have a uh, vocational degree, that that is what is driving the differences. So we also sort of like control control for that. Um, so effectively, what I what I show you, what I showed you is really about, uh, uh, um, yeah, these sort of educational networks, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so thank you for sharing this. Uh, so I had a question about um, and I, and I possibly misunderstood what you were showing, but it seems like people who uh, were highly educated had a lower probability of having low educated people um, in their networks when you do the random generation, whereas uh, lower educated people have a higher probability of having higher educated people um, in their network. Is that right? Just like, the other way around. The other way around. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess I'm trying to understand how you're thinking about like the probability of of encountering higher educated people, given that these are like a smaller proportion of the population than um, lower educated people, and whether this story that you told about the sort of um, decreasing rate of conservatism in younger generations 
is that, would, would you imagine that that comes from like an increasing proportion of highly educated people that has happened generation after generation? Or, or I guess I'm just trying to understand like if you have any thoughts behind uh, why it might be, why, why so many people might have these highly educated ties when they're like a minority of the population. It's a good question. And it, it's indeed the case that the difference in these baselines is exactly because there aren't 50% higher educated and 50% lower educated people. So that's that's completely that's that's completely why that difference is there, uh, and and that shows that um, you know for higher educated people there is sort of a higher propensity to end up in these networks uh, despite the fact that um, you know they're a smaller group of the population and for lower educated people. Um, as to sort of why that is the case, uh, we're sort of like ambiguous about that, and we don't really go into that as much, except for the fact that we clearly know that it has something to do with attending higher education. So it's it's probably just sort of, you know, like you you meet your friends in college when you go to college and those people will sort of stick with you and they're likely to go to similar jobs and move in similar cities. So that's sort of where these, um, where these ties uh, come from. Uh, and there was one other component of your question that I forgot, uh, I think. Um, just like how, how you view like this shifting proportion of people oh, yeah. who are uh, attaining higher education as maybe responsible or not for uh, decreasing levels of conservatism of people that are Right. Um, so I think that's probably likely part. Yeah, I think that's part of the story. Uh, and and that relates back to your first the first part of your question. Uh, um, you know, there there are more higher educated people right now. So the uh, you know even the random chance that you end up with only higher educated people in your network has increased. Uh, so I think that is, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's just a, a pretty decent explanation for why uh, younger people right now are not becoming more conservative. Um, Thank you very much for your talk. Your research is very interesting. Um, I was wondering, have you had a chance to study a situation where there is a high degree of contact over time between educated and um, not educated to see if that does take the edge off of the polarization. Um, so that you know, your hypothesis that more contact, you know, does it actually bring the polarization, you know, kind of bring it down? It's a good question. I mean, we've, we've looked for um, this setting, uh, we, one thing we played around with, for instance, I, I mentioned in my answer to Christoph, uh, this sort of tracking. So we looked at changes in tracking laws, um, you know, when when it happened that a certain generation of people that go to school are suddenly uh, uh, two years less in a class with others from different educate who will later end up not going or going to university. Uh, and we didn't really we didn't really find much there. So yeah, we're we're very much looking or a situation that we can use here. Uh, I have one thought for you, possibly, and I don't know that much about it, but yes, I in Vienna, there's um, quite robust social housing, uh -huh. um, which combines different income levels, um, which I think might turn out to be a proxy for education levels to some extent. And people, you know, the, the community, the housing communities are, are built with communal spaces and, um, you know, Lots of shared facilities. So I, my understanding is there's lots of interaction, um, and you know it would be interesting. And people stay in their communities, like you actually can, you know, move to different sides, you know, within the community based on your needs at different points in life. So I think they stay for an extended period of time. I wonder if that would be kind of an interesting little, you know, possible area to study. Like, okay, if there is high degree of interaction, um, you know, do people have as polarized views or discuss? This one thought I No, that's a great, and this was Indiana, you said, right? Sorry? Where was this? In Vienna. In Vienna, yeah. okay, Vienna, okay, yeah. sorry. I was already surprised it was Indiana in the US. No, 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 no. <laughs> it didn't sound yeah. like Indiana at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, that sounds like a great setting. I mean, it sort of reminds me, the, the best thing we came up with uh, is, uh, so in Amsterdam, 
when you choose which high school to go to, there are a couple of high schools that are extremely in demand because they're really good high schools. And then there are other high schools that are, uh, I mean, they're all amazing, but that are slightly less good. And these other high schools are usually what are called the Gesamtschule in German. So those are schools where you're not completely tracked. So you're also, at least for a couple of years, together with people with a different education level. And because these really good high schools where you're tracked right from the get-go are in such high demands, there is a, a lottery. So there's out there is literally the, Amsterdam municipality is sitting on this data set of people's names, their lottery number, and whether they were assigned to one of these completely tracked or non-tracked schools. Um, but they're absolutely not—they're not budging. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I think that could be—it could be a really cool option. Yeah, I think some of these um, programs are quite large in Vienna and quite successful. Um, so it might be something that. You know, oh, I believe. I personally, I also think it—it it would be. Uh, it's a really good solution. Yeah, because if you could prove that that actually does kind of give people, you know, talking to each other and increase the polarization, it could shape, you know, how you think about policy on how to integrate. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so persuasion or diffusion effects or self-selection or homophily effects, right? And I think the issue here is that, you know, mixing people up is, is great if the persuasion mechanism works, right? Because then you can actually persuade them to be more moderate and more sort of accepting of their views. But if it's just about self-selection, then all we're observing is basically that some people have a propensity to mix and others don't. And that actually doesn't sort of change. And so the outcomes are simply the effect of kind of, you know, this self-selection into the group that wants to mix with, with others. Yeah. It's a good point. Um, and I sort of think my best answer to that is that um, we would at least up to a certain degree observe that in there not being parallel trends in a different, right? Because you likely first your attitudes right if you select into a given network because you become more progressive and therefore you only want to hang out with other progressive people then your attitudes change before your network changes no, this, is, this is a propensity about making ties right, right. To, um that's the parallel trend right? yeah attitude. yeah but but the, but if you if your attitudes change before your network changes then that would be a violation of the parallel trends mm -hmm. right yeah. So, the, so I sort of, and 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 that would be self-selection, right? That's the type of self-selection you mean that because of your attitudes, you choose your friends. Not necessarily. No, no, okay. Because once you once you enter into the high tie treatment, if right. your attitudes change, it could be either because you're the type of person who's been seeking friends and finally finds them, or because you make these friends randomly and they get pers gets persuaded by them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah, that's also something we 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 can't really we can't really get at. Uh, I mean, I do think sort of like one one thing that may point in a direction that's slightly in favor of us is the fact that um, um, the effect is definitely stronger for your partner than for other ties. Right. So like you know, effectively, the person that's most likely to persuade you the strongest tie that you have, there we indeed find uh, a stronger effect. But it's not a a very good answer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think a bit late, so sorry that this is already been covered, but I was essentially wondering how much is the size of a community that somebody would impact the essentially like cities, towns, or just sort of what they interact with? Yeah, I mean we find we don't we don't really dive into the size of someone's community as in where they live physically. Um, but um, we do know in general that uh, whether you're in a rural or an urban area is uh, definitely quite important in predicting uh, you know what happens on these on these sets of outcomes uh, it could very well that part of that effect runs through uh, sort of these educational mechanisms that we uh, that we talk about um, uh, that, that that may be we haven't looked into that uh, yet uh, and we also find uh, which I showed you at the beginning that education level is nonetheless more important than uh, sort of the ruralness of where where you live Um, I was really um, convinced by the parallel trend plot that you had, but I was curious if, as if you, you had the year of educational attainment and what I was sort of if you did have a control for it. But I guess I'm thinking about losers of globalization who might have a mid career change and be prompted to go back to school and whether or not we see shifts in their network kind of later in life than we might expect. 
yeah that's that's a really that's like a pretty cool population to look at right like these people that later decide to go to university or like re-educate themselves um but you know unfortunately it's it's something that's so uncommon uh that is it's actually not really like feasible to to sort of like get at that Okay. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. I was thinking a little bit about your um, causal analysis at the end um, that you presented. And if I think about the treatment, there's sort of a couple of things going on, right? Like you can change your network because one of your friends gets educated or because you get a new friend. And it seems to me that the former of the two is like kind of a stronger, will be sort of a more convincing treatment. Them the two together. Is there a way to differentiate between the two or not really because they don't give the names of these people? So it's sort of hard to uh, figure out which one of the two it was. Um, so it's it's just not really it's not possible to do that. As in it's not the names are not in the data because you could see right, right? Like if the name stays the same but the education level changes, then it's clearly the person graduates, whereas if the name changes, it's a new person. But that's that's not data that they release. Yeah. Okay, so on that note because you talked about graduation, so I was a bit worried about that, um, because it seems like the the act of graduating isn't really the treatment. Like, it feels like going to school is the treatment, right? Like, the, once you're enrolled, you should be sort of surrounded by the people um, that, like, you know, have shares and progressive values that should make it more progressive. Um, and so I was kind of, that was a more nitty-gritty question about, like, how you call it, sort of, the, how you call it educational attainment, because if you look at completion of, of a, a particular degree it's um yeah it's, it seems like you're kind of you, you're kind of missing out on that group right that is finished with high school that's currently enrolled that experiences this this effect but that you know just hasn't had the formal degree yet that's a good point and we that's actually why for someone's own education we throughout the whole presentation we code that up uh, as whether you attend university or not attend or graduate uh, unfortunately, for the ties, we can do that because they're, you know, it, it might even be that people inconsistently answer the question because they just ask, what's the education level of this person? Uh, you know, and if your friends in university and you're both in the last year of your bachelor, are you then really going to enter high school? Well, you, you don't really know. Um, but for someone's own education level, there we like we, we, do, we do it as you suggest. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so gets the final word. No, no, no. It's a boring question. I just wanted to hear more about the data. And it's a panel survey where people are asked to list their ties in every year. Is that correct? Yes. Going back to uh, uh, and no. <laughs> um, so it's the same people that are interviewed across 14 waves. Uh, and uh, so it, it, right, these surveys are much more common in Europe than in the US, uh, where it's, just, it's not really done. Um, people back in the, in the 90s thought that this was, or the 2000s, I guess, thought that this was the solution to causal, causal, uh, causal issues to, to endogeneity, follow the same people over time. Uh, and sort of the nice thing about this survey compared to the other really big one in Europe, which is the German soup, uh, is that uh, you know, they were uh, one of the first more techie surveys. So it's the, it's the internet study. Um, uh, and that meant that a lot of the questions sort of like filled forward from the last answer, from the last wave. So everyone sees a unique survey, which means that they can add much more questions because people can just be like, oh, this didn't change for me. These five people are still the same, although, uh, so it's sort of, um, yeah, same people over, over, over multiple years. And on that impressive note, <laughs> thank you everyone for coming and please join me in thanking Yannick for a fantastic presentation.